Hi, I'm Barbara Morrow, and we're at the North Shire Bookstore, and uh, I'm really pleased to welcome our guest author, Philip Baruth. Welcome, Phil. Thank you. Phil is the uh, author of a new biography of Senator Leahy, who is very much in the news these days. Always, pretty much. Always, <laughs> which uh, is really interesting, and we'll we'll get to that because you talk a lot about his interest in in the media and mm -hmm. and how he is a, a real uh, pro at uh, getting media attention. Actually, we we could start with that because uh, I, have, sure. I have a lot of questions, but let's go with that. Uh, best place to start in that. Uh, area of discussion is 1974. So Pat Leahy gets elected against all odds in 1974 and he does it because he introduces different innovations in media that people in Vermont had never seen before. So uh, his opponent was running 60-second attack ads, Dick Mallory, who was the sitting Republican congressman. But Pat Leahy decided to create a half an hour campaign film, uh, an autobiographical campaign film that shot Pat Leahy and his wife Marcel and his parents and their kids and you know they uh, the people who made it called it the Leahy Walton film <laughs> and it was a reference to the Waltons which was this you know beloved sentimental story that was on TV at the time and they ran that film in 30 minute blocks in prime time and uh, within the space of a week, it moved him 12 points in the polls, and he wound up winning by a hair's breadth, just a little over 4,000 votes, wow. uh, a race that he never should have won, but again, for this attention and, uh, and innovation in media. And he's been able to pretty much stay in the public eye ever since, right? Right, especially since he became, uh, starting you know, back in the early 2000s he became the chair of Senate Judiciary when Democrats are in power mm -hmm. and from that uh, post he's been the go-to person to walk uh, Supreme, Co Supreme Court nominees through he's been the person to in the Bush administration to uh, really conduct oversight and uh, hearings on the George W. Bush administration Alberto Gonzalez wound up leaving office because of Leahy's hearings. Mm -hmm. uh, so he has a, a knack for, and I think a, a real skill in using the limelight. So now that he's in the minority and has lost uh, some of his clout, so to speak, um, how, how he, he doesn't seem to have diminished in terms of his influence, but right. but he doesn't have the same power that he did. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you go back to 2000, control of the Senate has shifted, I want to say, seven times hmm. uh, over the last 17 years. And each time Leahy goes up and down like a, like a, um, a merry-go-round, actually, merry-go-rounds go around, so <laughs> on, would that be a, a Ferris wheel? Yeah. Um, and, you know, when he's on the ascendant, um, his power really becomes extremely uh, noticeable. So mm -hmm. he can conduct hearings, he can do other things. When, you know, Democrats are, are retreating in terms of their authority, like now, they're not in control of any branch of Congress or the White House or the Supreme Court, um, he has to use the bully pulpit Mm -hmm. Senate-sized bully pulpit, mm -hmm. uh, but he's the most senior senator, and so he does get attention that way. Mm -hmm. So he's he's not feeling too um, sanguine these days, is he? I mean, it's hard. Is anybody really? Um, I doubt it. I, I mean, nobody I know anyway. Yeah, I think even even people who were uh, supporters of Donald Trump, and I'll take my father as an example. He voted for Donald Trump because he didn't like Hillary Clinton, and he's a businessman, and Donald Trump was a businessman. But at this point, five minutes, or I'm sorry, five months into Trump's term, my dad is off the bus. Oh, good. Uh, because he feels as though it's been a sort of disaster in terms of basic 
competency in government. Um, not to mention the questions and the scandals that are already swirling. But I, I think uh, Pat Leahy, it's fair to say, is um, viewing this as a worst case scenario. And he and the rest of our delegation, Peter Welch and Bernie Sanders, are mobilizing their people, uh, trying to mobilize Democrats and independents and fight back. Well, that's been my question is, is where are the Democrats, you know, and, uh, but I, I have to assume they're out there and they're working hard. They're out there and working hard, but the top story today, uh, I don't know when this will run, but the top story for June 2nd uh -huh. of 2017 is that Donald Trump ordered all government agencies to ignore requests from Democratic senators for information, uh, working up estimates of costs of bills. So the, the tools of government have become increasingly partisan. So if you're not in the majority and the Republicans are, it's now become a, a sort of um, double institutional handicap. Mm. So I think looking to 2018 is, is the best we can do Hope for, for. If, yeah. if, uh, if you want to change that. Yeah. Well, I am interested a little bit in, uh, or not just a little bit, in, in your background. Um, you started your writing career as a novelist. Right. And then uh, and you got your deg advanced degree in English literature. literature. Yeah, in, yeah. in literature. Yeah, I've kind of always um, gone back and forth between nonfiction and fiction and hybrids of the two. Uh -huh. So uh, I got a PhD in literature, but at the same time I was semi-secretly publishing novels and short stories. And it wasn't until I got a job at the University of Vermont and my first novel came out and they didn't have any idea that they were hiring a creative writer as well as a, an 18th century scholar. And to my shock and delight, they were um, happy to welcome me as a, a fiction writer too. So I've pretty much picked projects back and forth across that divide. Uh -huh. My last project before this one was a historical novel set in the 18th century uh -huh. of England. Uh -huh. And then this one is full on nonfiction biography. And then from here, I've got an idea for a sort of fantasy based novel. Uh -huh. So keeps it interesting. The subtitle of your book, can you yep. explain that? A Life in Scenes. Yeah, so that means a couple of different things to me. First of all, Pat Leahy, as I said, immersed always in media and um, innovating in media. So when I say that um, his career has taken place in scenes, going back to that 1974 campaign film, it was creating his own 30-minute film about himself mm -hmm. that put him into the Senate. From there, go all the way out to the... Uh, 2008, 2012 time frame, he's appearing in Christopher Nolan's blockbuster Dark Knight trilogy. Uh, so if you've ever seen The Dark Knight or The Dark Knight Rises, you saw Pat Leahy with Heath Ledger and Christian Bale and uh, Morgan Freeman, a lot of um, great, great actors. So there was that. Um, but the other way I look at the subtitle is I wanted to concentrate on the amazing sensational moments in Leahy's career. So being targeted by an anthrax letter, um, being a target among others in Congress on 9-11, and you know, a target uh, for other people during his career. His name appeared on a, a radical anti-abortion website, mm. and it was a website called Christian Gallery where they would list the names and then they would draw a red, a blood red line through the name when they had been assassinated. So um, Bernard Schleppi, an, an abortion doctor mm -hmm. in uh, New York, was killed. Mm -hmm. And then the next day his name was crossed off um, and Pat Leahy's name appeared there. So I wanted to cover those scenes mm -hmm. and jump cut over the parts of a senator's career that are very necessary 
and the bulk of what they do, but they're not as exciting. That is mm -hmm. the hours and hours and hours in a committee room uh, going through drafts of bills, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm in the state Senate myself, mm -hmm. and I know firsthand that there's a lot of what I do that bores people to tears. <laughs> so when I come home and I tell my wife this amazing story about an amendment that I drafted, and then we got 21 votes when I thought we'd get 25, and she could care less. And so I wanted to eliminate that aspect from the book and just pop out the, uh, the sort of pulse pounding parts of his career. Mm -hmm. And there, there are a lot of them. There really are. Yeah. It's, it's sort of, uh, it almost seems novelistic when you tell people, for instance, just to take the year 2001, uh, beginning of 2001, he becomes the chair of judiciary until Dick uh, Cheney is sworn in as vice president. That gives Republicans oh. another vote, so then he goes into the minority. But then Jim Jeffords oh, yes. switches parties. He becomes chair of judiciary again. Then 9-11. Then a month later, the anthrax attack mm. and the writing of the Patriot Act. That's all within 10 months. And, and he seems to be a pretty courageous guy. I mean, do, do yeah. the, I'm sure these things phase him. They certainly must phase his wife yeah. and his family. But whenever I've seen him, he, he seems totally in control, you know, like. What you just said is his whole career. Whenever I've seen him, that is on TV, on the news, he seems totally in control. So if you go back to his days as a prosecutor in Chittenden County, everyone's experience of Pat Leahy was, he was at every murder scene, uh, you know, dealing with the, the bloody crime scene, gathering evidence, chasing down the murderers. So everybody had this image of him that was very, based very much in fact, that he was capable of dealing with the worst uh, that society had to dish out and bring order and safety to, to the public. Did you interview him for this? Yeah, I interviewed him uh, five times, I think. Uh-huh. Um, some longer than others. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for a couple of hours, sometimes for uh, 45 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. I would have liked more, but uh, he's a very busy guy. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of archival work and interviews with people around him, uh, people who staffed him, people who uh, watched him reporters over the years, mm -hmm. people who had a uh, bird's eye view of his career. Were there any, um, there must have been, uh, negative reviews of, of Pat Leahy? Yeah, I would say, you know, the flip side of somebody being always on camera and always appearing uh, in control on camera is that if you're running against him, the camera is not facing you. So in 1974, Dick Mallory and his people really, really were agitated that he was on TV all the time, and they had a hard time getting covered. Um, and then if you go forward in his career, if anybody has a negative take on Pat Leahy, it usually has to do with how much he's on screen. You know, people have tried to turn that media image around and say, uh, there isn't any there there. It's all a media construction. but. I think that's next to impossible to do with the record that he's mm -hmm. compiled. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more votes than anyone in Congress. He's passed more groundbreaking legislation than anybody I can think of. The uh, Violence Against Women Act, the reauthorization in 2013, comes immediately to mind. Just a, a far-reaching piece of legislation to protect women from uh, violence and to allow them to redress violence when it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. So, but yeah, I mean the the negative take on Leahy going back 40 years is that um, he wanted to be on camera too much, but it's hard to quibble with what it's done for his career. You referenced his having been in um, the Dark Knight trilogy, right? And um, Apparently, he, he's long had a fascination with comic books and, and superheroes, right? Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, to take the simple um, line through it, 
when he was a, a little kid growing up in Montpelier, he would go to Donnelly's drugstore, and for a dime, he would get Batman comics and Superman comics, and he would go to serials at the movie theater and, you know, watch Tarzan and Batman and uh, Buck Rogers. So there's that that's going on, and that's a lifelong fascination. But beyond that, I, I think there's a way in which he's been able to take something like Batman and add that in a certain way to his own persona as a crime fighter. Um, oh. So the idea of being a crusader, you know, the caped crusader, it's no accident that over the course of his career, Le Leahy has himself been called a crusader many times. So his campaign against landmines to mm -hmm. take one example. Mm -hmm. And people, because he is so associated with Batman, people constantly uh, cross-pollinate between the two narratives. So when he's crusading against landmines um, and he appeared in a Batman film, the Washington Post was writing about the crusader from Vermont meeting the Cape Crusader. <laughs> and that more than anything shows how he's been able to almost without anybody realizing it he's sort of inked and colored his image so that it's a little larger than life it's it's almost uh you know comic book uh size itself and this is very conscious on his part i wouldn't i don't know if i would say that i would say that it's certainly instinctive uh-huh um you know he's known from the beginning how to construct this, uh, just as you said, you know, everyone sees him and he seems able to be in control and to, you know, fight injustice. Mm -hmm. And whether that's in the Senate or whether that's as a prosecutor, it all contributes to this uh, very effective image that he's put together. One of the, the things I learned in your book was that Pat Leahy is blind in one eye. He's uh, born legally blind in his left eye, and that's because his mother had toxoplasmosis, which is the disease you get from cats. So uh, when my wife was pregnant, out of nowhere, the doctor said, do you have a cat? And we said, no. And he said, good, because changing the litter box can transmit this infection. Wow, I've never heard that before. Yeah, that's the only way it's really carried to humans. And um, so his mother unwittingly passed that to him and he was born with uh, very little sight in his left eye. And as you say, if you look at his early life, it's a, it's a very distinct pattern. In college, he only goes out for things related to politics or things that require excellent eyesight. So he's a photographer for the yearbook. He's on the rifle team as a sharpshooter. And uh, he excels in both those areas because when you think about it, in both cases with a gun and a camera, you have to close one eye. And so he was competing on a level playing field with other kids. And, um, and I think that's had a lot to do with becoming a photographer and engaging in what I would call the politics of witness, going to other countries to see firsthand mm -hmm. what's going on, often take photographs and come back and bring attention to that, like the situation in Tibet, for instance. Has he gone to Tibet? He did, and uh, it's one of his favorite stories. So he goes to Tibet and goes with a camera and is taking photographs. And a uh, couple of interesting things happen. One is that he realizes his room is bugged. And um, oh. so he has this uh, sort of elaborate story about how he told everyone on his team it was bugged. He had to write it down and pass a piece of paper around. Um, but then the other thing that happened that was uh, sort of fascinating is he's in the street and he's taking photographs and a man came up to him and was pointing at himself and Leahy realizes that the man wants him to take a, a, a picture of him. So Leahy is focusing the camera and just before he snaps the picture, the man opens his coat and he has a picture of the Dalai Lama. And so Leahy has this amazing picture of this Tibetan man secretly opening his coat because there are Chinese agents mm -hmm. who are watching the congressional delegation. 
He opens his coat just enough so that you can see the picture of the Dalai Lama, and then he closes it. So Leahy has that photo framed on his wall, and mm -hmm. when the Dalai Lama came to oh. Leahy's office, he took him over to show him the picture, and the Dalai Lama started crying. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to capture a story that gets at that visual aspect for Leahy more than that. That's a beautiful story. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, it's an amazing story, but it's not the only one that he'll tell you if you sit with him for a couple of hours. You know, he has endless stories that are just that cool. How did you decide to write this biography? What was the impetus for, for writing it? So uh, my wife is Swedish, mm -hmm. and uh, we were visiting her parents in Sweden, and my brother-in-law wanted to take me to the premiere of The Dark Knight in Sweden. And uh, I thought, great, because I really wanted to see it. So we went to this big multiplex in Stockholm. So his name is Christian, and we were sitting there surrounded by Swedes. Uh, well, he's Swedish too. I was surrounded by Swedes. <laughs> and, uh, and at a certain point, Leahy comes out and confronts the Joker in this famous scene. And I said, that's Pat Leahy. <laughs> and my brother-in-law was like, who's Pat Leahy? And I said, I'll tell you after. And so on the way home, I told him that's my senior senator from Vermont. And both of our minds were blown, his a little more than mine, because what, what's a senator doing in a movie? Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know, but I'll check it out and get back to you. Mm -hmm. So I went to the library thinking I should read the biography on Pat Leahy, because there's obviously a lot more to his life than I know. And there was no biography. So then I got a little curious, and so I started looking for chapters about Leahy in other people's books. And there really wasn't, other than news stories, there were no books that dealt with Leahy's career. And uh, so I said, that's just wrong, and uh, started working on one myself. You also talk about uh, Senator Leahy being fascinated with um, the internet. Yeah. Long about 2000, uh, papers like the New York Times are calling him the cyber senator. And that was a nickname that came out of his early support for the internet. He was the second senator to have a website. Hmm. Uh, Ted Kennedy beat him by a couple of weeks. Really? But uh, his uh, support for and, and caucus about the internet, so that he was one of the co-founders of the Internet Caucus in the Senate. Those were things that allowed him to gain real credibility mm -hmm. uh, among the early architects of the Internet and the early uh, influential personalities on the Internet. Then that uh, hits a real bad patch when in 2010 he brings out a bill called COICA that would have allowed for a certain kind of regulation of the internet by the Department of Justice, the Attorney General. And there's a big spasm of uh, resistance to this on the internet, and it ultimately culminates in a protest online involving Google, Facebook, Wikipedia, Tumblr, uh, every major website you could imagine. And for the space of a day, they were all protesting uh, one of Pat Leahy's bills called PIPA, uh, Preventing Internet Piracy Act. And like COICA, it would have allowed for a certain kind of regulation of the internet. And real uh, internet freedom advocates felt that it would have broken the internet. Hmm. And so uh, Pat Leahy really got a lot of negative pushback on those bills, which he was doing to try to stop the piracy of uh, Hollywood films abroad. I see. And uh, so, you know, for all the credibility he had as an early advocate of the internet, he, um, he wound up with a, a black eye over that particular incident. Mm. Is there anything else um, major that we have not addressed in, in Senator Leahy's career that you would like to talk about? Well, I'll, I'll give you one last thing, and that's the opening of Cuba. Ah, yes. 
very end of Obama's term, he decided to normalize relations with Cuba. Pat Leahy actually played a, a really significant part in that. But I'll give you the most amazing surprise of any surprise I had in writing this book. So in the opening of Cuba, it was a very delicate series of trades between Cuba and the US. And among other things, they traded imprisoned intelligence agents. So we had some Cuban agents in prison, and they had an American intelligence asset, although America denied that that was the case and um, denied to this day that that was the case. So um, Alan Grossman was his name. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was they were going to exchange these prisoners, which they did. Mm -hmm. On the same day that they announced the opening of Cuba and the normalizing of relations, the, the jet carrying Alan Grossman came to the US and the jet carrying the Cubans went back to Cuba. That's all pretty amazing, spectacular, but there was this secondary story that was even more amazing. So when one of the Cuban agents, who's been in prison for uh, about 10 years, I think, when he goes to Havana and lands, his wife is there, and his wife is eight months pregnant. And She hasn't seen him in 10 years. No, and everybody's very embarrassed by this, uh, because what are you gonna say? until they point out that it is his child. And, well, how can it be his child? It was artificial insemination. Well, how did that happen? And the answer is Pat Leahy. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and so I start digging into it, and what happened was when Pat Leahy and his wife Marcel were in Cuba one time, the Cuban government said, would you be open to meeting with this woman who has a humanitarian request. And they said, okay. So in their hotel room comes the wife of this Cuban uh, agent mm -hmm. who's in uh, an American prison. She's worried that he'll never be released and she's getting older and she wants to have his child. And so she begs them to find a way to make this happen. So there was one precedent for artificial insemination in the US federal prison system. Mm. So Leahy and his people, again, as part of a series of complex give and take, they uh, allow for his wife uh, and the husband to do what needs to be done to fertilize uh, an egg. It's implanted into her. The first didn't take. The second did take. And the timing was such that when he touches down, the baby's born three months later, oh. and the headline in the Cuban paper is, uh, this detente between the countries has now borne fruit. Oh, and that's a great story. It's like a Mission Impossible story, but yeah. the amazing thing is that reporters kept finding out that Pat Leahy was making all of this stuff happen. So, so there you go. What a guy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to thank you, Phil, for, for coming to the North Shire. We're sure. looking forward to having you talk about your book uh, tonight. And uh, congratulations. Thanks a lot. It's really been great talking to you. And can I just say thank you for keeping the store in business? Oh. It's, it's absolutely uh, one of the treasures in terms of independent bookstores. Mm -hmm.